Hi, my name is Barry Sterling Mitchell. I produce the Sterling Net Point Power Rankings and the Bias Plus Reports. Today is May 8th, 2024, and this is Ben and Barry on football. What's going on out there, everybody? This is Ben Dickerson. I am your co-host. I don't produce anything except fantasy football chips, but I digress. Yes, you do. That, that's a digression. But you do. You do. You and your daughter both have championships. Yes, yeah, so absolutely. Passing down the legacy. You always talk about the, the legacy players in the NFL. So <laughs> we got a le legacy player. And fantasy football going for you. So, and she listens to Ben and Barry on football. So, no wonder she's so good at what she does. <laughs> okay. So, what do you got for us today, Mr. Dickerson? Well, what I have for you today is uh, obviously the NFL draft is over. Uh, we went over my mock draft last week, which I did really, really well. And I was very proud of myself. I pat myself on the back once again. I did so well with that. However, it occurred to me that before the draft, I had something on my mind that I meant to check. And I did, in fact, check it last week. And that was to see if any, any players from any HBCUs actually got drafted. And the answer to the question is no. Not one HBCU player was selected during the draft. However, there were a few who were signed as undrafted free agents. And I just wanted to make that clear and kind of let everybody know who those guys were in case possibly they went to a school that somebody out there went to or somebody was following them or somebody may choose to follow them because they got signed by maybe your favorite team and you want to check up on them during training camp well, rookie camp starts, I believe, on the 13th. So uh, rookie camp is first, then they're off, then training camp starts, and then, you know, OTAs and all that other stuff. So um, I wanted to let everybody know who those guys were, in case anybody was interested. All right, all right. Well, let's get it off then. Uh, okay. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm just going to run down the list. I'm just going to give you the name, where they're from, and what team they signed with. Uh, I didn't I didn't do a whole lot of research on each one because I've been doing that so much for the last couple of weeks. So just if you hear your team name or you hear the name of a player that strikes you that you may, might want to keep up with them, please do. So first off, I got wide receiver D'Angelo Hardy. He's a 6'1", 208-pound wide receiver out of North Carolina Central. He was signed by the Baltimore Ravens. All right. I got a cornerback, uh, Jordan Tolls, 6'1", 209 from Morgan State. Ooh. Also signed by the Baltimore Ravens. Uh-oh. Yeah, right. I got a cornerback, Willie Drew, 6 feet, 185 out of Virginia State. He's going to the Carolina Panthers. Running back, Ian Wheeler, 5'11", Two, all these guys, by the way, are good size for their positions also, by the way. Just wanted to let everybody know these, these are not any small little guys playing small-time football. Uh, running back Ian Wheeler is 5'11", 205. He's out of Howard. He was signed by the Chicago Bears. Another running back, Jarvion Howard, 5'10", 200 pounds, Alcorn State. He's going to the Green Bay Packers. A linebacker, Jablonski Green, 6'2", 285. That's really big for a linebacker. South Carolina State, Indianapolis Colts. Cornerback, Mikey Victor, 6'3", 200 pounds, Alabama State. He'll be signed by, he's been signed by the New England Patriots. Wide receiver, Marcus Riley, 5'11". 175. He's out of your beloved Florida A and M. Ah! Yeah, there's somebody for you to keep up with and see if he makes the team. May. Yes, sir. He's signed by the New York Jets. J E T S Jets Jets Jets. Don't you school that any family to play for? <laughs> Offensive tackle Anim Dankwa, mm. 6'8", 353 out of Howard University. 
going to the Philadelphia Eagles. Really? Yes. Six. Edge rusher, Sundiata Anderson, 6'4", 245, Rambling State, going to the Seattle Seahawks. Mm. And that is my list. So if there's anybody there that you want to keep an eye on, I'm going to kind of try to keep my list and keep an eye on all these guys. Hopefully they make the teams. Um, they got bigger as your list went on. It was like 6'1", six, 6'1", one, six, one, five eleven. Six, yeah, well, that's because they started with the wide out. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> awesome, awesome. And you're right, you know, none of them, uh, no HBCUs got picked. Um, and so I did see that some of them went in as undrafted free agents. So I'm glad you had a chance to kind of track where they went. You know, so we can keep an try to keep an eye on these guys and see where they where they go. You know, and hopefully, yep. at the very least, they'll make the practice squads. You know, at the very least, some kind of way, so they can live out their dreams, man. Because yeah. obviously, you know, that's what these guys are all about. And all is not lost as far as not being drafted and and making this a profession. Um, undrafted free agents are signed for three years. So they get three-year contracts. Uh, those contracts are usually based on the league minimum, which was $750,000. It is now $795,000. It just went up for this season. So uh, that ain't bad money. That's some beautiful money right there. And, but that is assuming that they don't get cut, right? At some well, right. Right. They don't have any guarantees in their contracts. Or uh, no. Okay. Okay. It's a tough life, man. But, you know, if you love football and you think you can do it, you know, we saw our, our young guy, uh, Corey Clement, become an undrafted free agent with the Philadelphia Eagles and in his first year go on and win a Super Bowl and play an integral part in winning that Super Bowl and then have at least a five-year career um, where he's done pretty well for himself in that time frame. So, you know, 750000 for, you figure the average person, they're making 50000 a year, you know. That's, right, and that's the first year. Each year after that, it actually goes up about 100000 Wow, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. No wonder those guys are knocking themselves out in the UFL. <laughs> right. That's I watched right. a little bit of UFL. Team is down. Let me see here. They use the the play where you got to get like 15 to get a first down. Right. They get the first down. They drive all the way downfield. And there's a lot of go back and forth with some uh, penalties and things of that nature. But they score and go up. They leave like a minute left on the clock. They kick the ball off to the other team. And they're, they're, they're only up like two, one or two, something okay. like that. They kick the ball off to the other team. He runs it back to their 40 practically, right? Wow. Then they pick up a penalty, like 12 men on the field type penalty. And the next thing you know, the other team kicks the field goal and they lose anyway. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> like the last two minutes of the game was mad. It was crazy. That's crazy. So, you know. And you know what? Those little rules that they have like that to take the place of like onside kicks and stuff, I like those rules. Okay. I think they're challenging enough to make you have to really think about, am I going to really try to do this? It's something that you have to like scheme up and practice. So you can be ready for it if you need it. You know, I, I don't see anything wrong with those rules. I really don't. Well, the, the NFL is adopting some of them, at least temporarily, to see how they work when it comes to the kickoff and stuff like that. So you'll have, you'll get a taste of that stuff in the NFL. We'll have to see how that all goes. But, uh, yeah. That rule in particular, though, I really like because I believe they tracked – uh, the number of onside kicks that were tried and how many were successful is very, oh, yeah. very... It's like 5% success rate. Yeah, it's really yeah. small. Where, Whereas if you put... I, I'd much rather put the ball in my offense's hands to try to get it back. 
than depend on an onside kick that you don't know where the heck it's going to go. Man. But we've seen some exciting onside kicks. Who was it? Was it the Seahawks where the guy, was it the tight end, went up and ball bounced off of his hands and <laughs> he wound up, the other team wound up recovering and and I think it was a playoff game. It was a big game, too. Oh, that happens a lot. Uh, the Colts, uh, what game was it? The Colts had one uh, surprise onside. And, uh, oh, right. Uh, I remember it was the Colts because it was a guy that played for the Eagles. Um, ah, it was a receiver. He fumbled. He had it. They were the return team. He had it. And somebody hit him, and he fumbled it, and the other team recovered and got the ball back, and they ended up winning the game. That was a playoff game. I can't remember who the heck it was, though. I, for some reason, I think it was the Saints. Well, I was getting ready to say, probably the number one onside kick to remember is the Saints. Was it a Super Bowl game? Yes, yes. Five, yes, yes. At the halftime? <laughs> yes. So. Open the second half with it. Yeah. 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 That was a big one. That was a big one, man. That's that uh shocked a lot of people. Nobody was ready for that. So that's how you got to do it sometime. But we'll see how it works out in the NFL this year. All right. Well, fantastic. Um, let's take a look at our Facebook page. We have a few things that we want to talk about, some current events and some hot topics. All right, Benny. So let's start out. With the Dolphins signing Odell Beckham Jr., you know they showed they showed Odell's highlights from when he was with the Ravens. He had some hell of five highlights. I mean, it made me wonder why they let him go. His some of his highlights look so good. I mean, he's not the every down guy that they had, you know. But, I mean, wow, some of the stuff that he did, like, and they were, like, a lot of touchdowns, too, you know, some great catches, some great run after catches and things of that nature. So what do you think about the Dolphins signing Odell? I tell you what, this this doesn't really move the meter for me. Uh, he's on the back end of his career. His production is really low. Um, and he's playing behind Tyreek Hill and, and Jalen Waddle. So, you know. A little bit of depth. A little bit of depth. Oh, no doubt. You know, I think we'll see him. I think we'll see him, you know. Um, oh, I'm not saying he's not going to play. But, like I said, his production is low. If he catches two passes a game, he's doing pretty good. Well, like I said, the ones he was catching with the Ravens and, and the few catches that he got, he, he made some big plays out of them. So, I'm looking forward to see how he syncs up with those guys. I think they're happy to have him. So, Benny... NFL total access. Um, commentators like Michael Irvin are all being asked. The NFL seems to be going, I'm not sure where they're going in terms of their shows. But come September, it's probably going to look very different uh, than what we've been seeing and what we've gotten used to. Now, I know the Good Morning Football people were going out to L.A., at least some of them. I think most of them went, but I don't know if someone decided not to go. But I was, I mean, it seemed to me like they, like, the NF, first of all, all they're doing now is replaying games for the most part. So they don't really have a viable replacement in place for this temporary period. Um, Total Access is still getting some play. So I see them in the evening, but they're on for a short period of time. So, I mean, have you heard anything about what's going on with uh, the NFL in terms of this? No, but when you think about it, I mean, all the all the morning shows and the daytime shows, all the best ones are on ESPN and, and Fox. They really don't have a competitive daily show. Now, I don't know if they're going to try to revamp their programming and get one. But let's remember, those other shows do other sports, where NFL Network only does the NFL. Now, I'm sure they can find content. Heck, we find content. You know what I'm saying? But in order to be able to uh, 
compete with those other shows during the day, Monday through Friday, that's going to be kind of tough. Yeah, I can understand that. I can understand that. Hey, look, if Mina Kimes can hold it down with her dog, man, come on, NFL. You can, you can do a little something, something, put something together. Yeah, but oh, she's on Fox. Never tease. What I'm saying, I mean, it's a basic football show. You know what I mean? She doesn't talk basketball. She doesn't talk anything but football, but she gets deep into it. No, she talks other sports. On her show. Yeah. I, I've never seen her talk other, you know, stuff on her show. Most of the time when she's on her, now when she's on some of the other shows, you know, like the game type shows and stuff like that, I've seen it. And she's knowledgeable about everything, but it seems like she really sticks to the knitting on her show. So we'll keep an eye out on that and see what the NFL is planning on doing. <clears throat> Night and day. From last year's quarterback group. That's what's coming out of the uh, Pittsburgh Steelers uh, locker room now. And uh, so you're talking about Russell Wilson and Justin Fields as compared to the former quarterbacks that the Steelers had. So um, Russ, Russ, what's he got a Pittsburgh uh, Pirate uh, uniform going yep. on there? Yep. Another one of those uh, bas baseball guys that come over and really are able to do some, some interesting things um, on the football field. So uh, I'm looking forward to that. Now, again, I think he's going to do well. I don't know if you felt that way originally. You, you, how do you think about him now? Uh, I think uh, they're going to make sure that he's comfortable in their system. I think they're going to be a, a lot less rigid than things were for him in, in Denver, um, making it easier for him to adapt to their way of doing things. Um, their offense probably suits him a little bit better. He'll have better weapons. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Actually, their offense, their offense is primed and ready, to tell you the truth. Uh, I, I believe he'll do well also. The thing is, though, He's got to remember, he's on a short leash. So it's not like there's no pressure. Yeah, they named him the starter, but he's on a short leash. They didn't bring Justin Fields there for nothing. You know, they, I mean, they have a long range plan and a short range plan with Justin Fields. Long range, if Russ plays well, you're still only get, going to get what? Two more, three more years out of him tops. Justin Fields is what, 23 years old, 22? Okay. You know, and if Russ stumbles, here we go. <laughs> we have an article that I put up on the website. And, I, you know, I had forgotten that the players that, um, that come in and get these five-year rookie deals, that – they're, on the third year of their contract, teams have to start making decisions on these guys. So it was really interesting to see, you know, um, how that works. And there's a lot of little intricacies on that. Um, and some of the guys whose contracts are coming up for review in the third year, uh, interesting group there. So I just want to tell everybody, get a chance, go over to Bed and Barry on football, take a look at that article and have an idea about when you see some of the decisions that these guys are making, that these teams are making, what's behind those decisions in terms of the business uh, of these contracts? <clears throat> so they have to make, like I said, I'm thinking just fifth year, you know, then I look at well, it's third year, they got to start making this, the decisions. Well, th that's because the first two years of a rookie contract, you're locked in. You can't talk about the contract. You can't negotiate anything. You're that's what it, it is. What it is. However, once you hit your third year, I'm sorry. Once you play the last game of your third year, you are then allowed to talk about a new contract, an extension, a renegotiation, or whatever. Now, whether or not the team does it is another story. But you're still under contract for at least a fourth year, and the team has the option of 
uh, keeping you on contract for a fifth year if, in fact, you were a first-round pick. So let's say a guy comes in and, bam, he's rookie of the year. Second year, he's a pro bowler. He balls out. When his third year comes, they can say, hey, you know what? We're going to throw out your fourth year. We're going to throw out the option year, and we're going to sign you for four years now. And that would be your second contract. And that's the major goal of an NFL football player, to get to your second contract. Yeah. So, but that doesn't happen until the end of the third year of the rookie contract. All right. All right. We talked about Colin Coward actually listing the Rams as first. that He expected them to win the division. And one of the reasons that I'm thinking might be the fact that they're returning 74, almost 75% of their players from the field. Mm, yeah. Interesting. And we saw when we looked at it before a couple of weeks ago, we saw that teams were averaging closer to 50%. So about half of the team was being turned over. So if you can keep three, three quarters of your team in place and they're good, you could be competitive. You could be competitive. I don't think they're going to beat my Niners, but I am biased on that. Well, they were a playoff team. They did lose a barn burner to the Lions. I remember that clearly because the game was just on. If you're talking about NFL Network only replaying games, that game was on like two days ago, and it was a heck of a game. Uh, went down to the wire. But uh, – yeah, if if you can return 70 something percent of your team and your team was already a playoff team, I would think that that bodes pretty well for your season coming up. There's no guarantees or nothing. I'm just saying that's that's a pretty big plus. Yeah, that is a pretty big plus. That is a pretty big plus you can do that. So and I believe in continuity. I think that helps, you know. Now, Benny. Right. And because you believe in continuity, you better not be getting rid of Ayuk. Let's talk about the Niners for a second. Let's, 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 let's bring up your favorite subject. Keep that guy, man. Listen, this one, this, this is what I heard. So you drafted Ricky Pearsall, right? Ricky Pearsall's nice. He was, Florida. He was nice. Yes, yes. This kid can run some routes. He ain't no real speed burner, but he's got good speed, and he is a route runner. He People going to hate me for this. He runs routes better than Debo. Debo's a playmaker, okay? This kid is a route runner. Now, the guy, the odd man, on, the odd man out will probably be Juwan Jennings, Okay. But if Pearsall works out, like I'm pretty sure he will, uh, you can hang on to Ayuk. And 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 if you think you need to get rid of somebody for some pieces or some draft picks or whatever, that kind of frees you up to let Debo go. If it was me and somebody had to go, besides Juwan Jennings, it'd be Debo. That's I've just heard, me. I heard that. I heard that. Yeah. I've also heard that the Niners like to wait to sign. Uh -huh. So uh -huh. I'm thinking they'll, you know, this will be settled probably closer to preseason, somewhere in that area. But I don't think they want to let Ayuk go. Well, I know they no. don't. They said they don't want to let Ayuk go. You know, Here's the crazy thing, though. Debo. What you don't want to do is you don't want to wait too long because if C.D. Lamb signs before – Justin Jefferson's up next, I think. If he signs and if C.D. Lamb gets more to him, now you might have to overpay for Ayuk, and that will not be good. Yeah, If I was them, He's I'd get to trying to sign him soon. I agree. I agree. Um, it's just getting more and more expensive. These contracts are yep. getting bigger and bigger and bigger. You know, and he wants a premier contract. So, yep. you know, we'll have to see how that goes. But, wow, you know, if C.D. Lamb, if Justin Jefferson signs, I mean, that's got to be a big contract. He's going to be in the 20s per year. Yeah, yeah. He's, it's a big contract, so it's no doubt about it. Wanted to mention that I read in one of the business 
uh, papers that the NFL is considering allowing institutional money into the sport. So apparently, if you can have a private equity group who can raise capital and they're looking at letting them buy into the uh, into you know partial ownership. Now they want to they want to have some rules, and that's what they're trying to come together now. Like, what would be the exit strategy? Um, how much would they be allowed to buy? Would they be allowed to also buy into other sports? Is one of the things that the NFL probably does not want to happen. So, if you're going to buy into the NFL, if you're going to put money into the NFL. They want you just to be dealing with them. And I don't think they want you being able to buy into multiple teams either. So this is something you, know, you have to keep an eye on because this could bring a whole nother level of cash into the NFL uh, on a team by team basis. Did you say institutional? Yes. So, so that's not like I own Walmart and I want to buy a team. No, this is okay. What, what what are we talking about here? So this is Walmart's owner, Costco's owner, and another owner put together money in a private equity group that's named something else completely. Isn't that what they already do? No, not really. So let's say the equity group is ABC Equity Group, right? It's not like they're buying the team. ABC Equity Group is going to be able to buy a portion of the team. But again, but, they're not going to be able to, you know, they don't, what they don't want is for them to be able to do football and baseball and basketball. Apparently this is going on in other sports. I, wasn't I don't confused. I don't understand. I'm, I'm confused. Josh Harris owns part of the Sixers. He owns part of the New Jersey Devils. He owns soccer teams. He owns all kinds of stuff. But he owns the team. No, he owns a portion of the team. He owns a portion of the commanders. Magic Johnson oh, owns a portion he's the of the majority. Commanders. He's the majority owner. Yes, there are other minority owners. So, so we're talking about minority owners. Right. We're talking about minority ownership out of what that of money that have been put together in a group just to buy. There's no particular owners, not like where you have uh, the dolphins, you, you have um the, uh, the Tennant sisters. Uh, William sisters. William sisters, you know. Right. I got you. And oh, okay, 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 okay. Because because Magic has a piece of the Dodgers, too. Right, right. So I guess if you're I got you. Individual, you can do it. But they don't want... So you're talking about a group of people that get together specifically to buy a portion of, of, of an NFL team. Yes, yes. I got you. All right. A lot of, lot of um, you know, questions still in the air about this, but it'll be interesting to see, you know, how this goes. And like I said, when you start talking about private equity, you might be talking about a lot more money. I mean, I think once, once the uh, um, the commanders were sold for the amount of money that they went for, uh, it naturally attracted a lot of attention for other types of investors. So that's right. what's happening there. Okay. Well, Betty, I don't have a whole bunch. This is about it. Uh, do you have any final words for today's show? Uh, no, just keep an eye out for uh, rookie camp starting. I believe the date is the 13th. I'd have to double check that, but I know it's coming up very, very soon. Also keep an eye out for some more signings. I want to hear about these first, second, and third rounders getting signed to these contracts. I'm sure teams are working on those, talking to agents, and getting that done like right now so that by the time uh, actual real training camp starts up, that they'll have most of those guys signed, except for probably, you know, the, the first round picks usually get signed last. But um, that's all in the works right now. So there's a lot going on behind the scenes, but we're about to be seeing some guys in uniform real, real soon. So I'm looking forward to that. All right, fantastic. Well, thanks for following. Please leave comments and suggestions. Our hashtag is football is life. 
And our website is www.benandbarryonfootball.com. All right, signing off.